Oh, hi, Eric. Why can't I stand where I'm not straight in the light? I'll sit here. Yeah, that works. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Oh, come in, come in. Okay, let's start every. Oh, <laughs> just a second. I know. I, I'm grabbing this spot here. I know. Okay, it's a couple more minutes. Okay, I'll start. Hi everyone, Chris, Ski Institute colleagues, students, friends, and visitors. It is a great pleasure to introduce our distinguished ski lecturer, Peter Beagle. Peter is professor of statistics at the University of California at Berkeley. Let me note right here that visiting us at the University of Utah, <laughs> Peter was impressed by the fact that our university was founded in 1850, <laughs> almost two decades before the University of California was founded in 1868. Five. <laughs> oh, well, Wikipedia says eight. Well, I don't know. I like, well. <laughs> Five is the end of the Civil Before. War. <laughs> Anyways, we were founded earlier. <laughs> In his career, Peter may, may very well be the definition of statistics. These days, statistics is what we all find ourselves doing in our laboratories. Statistics is what the newspapers tell us. We lend our students high paying jobs. Statistics is what our students plan to use when they graduate and go on making our world a better place. So, before getting his PhD in statistics, also from UC Berkeley, and this fact is also from Wikipedia. Peter actually got his bachelor's degree from Caltech in physics. Oh, oh Wikipedia is all wrong. <laughs> Anyways. It wasn't Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> but you can fix it. So did you study physics? I did, actually. And then I discovered that my spatial intuition wasn't good enough. <laughs> so okay. I well, so he did study physics, and today... And I didn't finish Caltech. Actually, did. all my degrees are at Berkeley. I went to okay. Caltech for two years. I hated it. I left, and I went back, okay. <laughs> went back to Berkeley. Okay. So is entirely wrong. Anyways, physics is also relevant for statistics. Today, we have differential equations that mathematically describe the physical world. As all of us from physics know, however, before these equations, there were data. And there was the question of what, to, what do the data tell us? As a classical example, it was the vast number of astronomical tables that were available to Kepler and Newton, which enabled accurate prediction of planetary motions and later also the discovery of universal gravitation. There are also examples from quantum physics, but anyways. Peter's research work spans most, if not all, of the areas of statistics. Indeed, with statistics being such a relatively young field, much younger than physics, for example, Peter's work is now the make of textbooks in statistics, several of which he authored himself. For example, he worked on semi-parametric models, adaptive estimation, and asymptotic theory. He studied hidden Markov models, which are important, for example, in speech recognition as well as molecular biology, and he studied them in the context of maximum likelihood. His well-known book, Mathematical Statistics, Basic Ideas and Selected Topics, which is now in its second edition, includes example problems from the National Security Agency, or the NSA, our recently arrived very quiet neighbors here in Salt Lake City. Peter authored hundreds of research papers as well as several books, and these have been cited tens of thousands of times. His most highly cited work includes both the textbook on mathematical statistics, which not surprisingly is very mathematical, uh, and the 2007 Nature paper inaugurating the ENCODE project, which details discoveries from the large-scale molecular biological data, but does not have a single equation in the print paper. <laughs> there may be equations in the supplementary materials, <laughs> but I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. Peter is also a great mentor. The list of more than 50 PhD students who graduated from his group, together with the list of his research collaborators over the years, reads as the statistics volume of who is who. 
From his research and teaching work, Peter won many awards and citations, including an honorary doctorate degree from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and fellowships in the, Acad in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. He also served as a president of the Bernoulli Society and as a president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. So please help me welcome Peter to the Ski Institute. Thank you very much, Orly, and thank you for inviting me to to, uh, to to this institute, which I've learned quite a lot about uh, <laughs> this morning, and and, and uh, find fascinating. It's it's actually fairly remote, of course. I never have done anything, I think, uh, about well, computing, yes, but mainly done by others, <laughs> and 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 pictures, no. <laughs> But but uh, anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and and um, uh, I have to say that n there were no problems about the NSA <laughs> in my book <laughs> because if there were, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> I, I do have an NSA panel, which which not meets once a year on unclassified problems. So 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 anyway, okay. So 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 thanks again. And um, what I want to tell you about is, is uh, ENCODE and US. So US is uh, uh, what Orly referred to as my group. It's not really my group. It's some PhD students, <laughs> some postdocs, and my colleague Haiyan Huang. And, 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 and uh, there's not, not a wet lab in sight. <laughs> OK, so the outline of the story is that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the ENCODE project, history and achievements, and in this case, I will have have uh, I will actually be pirating slides from my friend Mike Snyder, at um, a geneticist at Stanford, um, who gave this talk in a in a workshop in Washington not too long ago, or gave a talk in a uh, workshop in Washington not too long ago. Our participation in ENCODE, uh, then early ENCODE, which uh, description of these two things which we, I guess, are, are primarily associated with uh, in, in that enterprise. Um, middle ENCODE, some other projects, and current ENCODE. So, um, all right, so here's the first pretty slide of, 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 uh, of Mike Snyder's. And uh, it's actually adapted from, from uh, two papers. Um, one in 2004, which was actually uh, the ENCODE pilot project. ENCODE pilot project started around 2003. And the other one uh, from the end of ENCODE 2. And uh, ENCODE, by the way, as, as I think most of you know, is the encyclopedia of DNA. And its humble goal was to functionally annotate every element of the human genome. Uh, I, when I first read that, I thought, gee, you know, they're going to relate it all to phenotype or something? No. Uh, <laughs> in fact, of course, they mainly, I think, the, the major grand conclusion is that everything is much more complicated <laughs> than, than we thought. And, 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 and the annotation is really biochemical annotation to the extent it's, it's there. Uh, and so here you see, actually, uh, Various, um, well, schematic picture of the of a, of a section of the of the um, three billion base pairs and uh, places again schematically rendered of elements which have been uh, discovered not just by ENCODE but which ENCODE uh, uh, you know cataloged in large part. Long-range el regulatory elements, enhancers, repressors, silencers, insulators, promoters in front of genes, transcripts of genes. Genes produce lots of transcripts. And then on top, you have a whole bunch of essays, of assays, not essays, of which try to get and identify these sites. So CHIP, for example, CHIP-seq is um, uh, not star sites, it's binding sites. Um, RNA seq is basically the output of, of, of uh, 
basically about the, RNA, the mRNA output of genes, and, and then some of the others I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> okay. Here to give you an idea of, 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 of the dimensions of ENCODE, uh, as you can see, there were some several hundred cell lines, uh, a lot of them initially cancer cell lines, and therefore not so representative as one would wish. Uh, 1,700 assays um, and uh, performed in, in a large number of experiments. Certainly many terabytes of data. I don't know how many, but many. And it's uh, mainly uh, in the Santa Cruz genome browser. OK. Um, one of the things which, which, which brought us into ENCODE, or the first thing we really did there, was as part of establishing a uniform analysis pipeline. I mean, this is a huge operation. 350 people all over the world, many labs, and it's going to be producing all this data, which is going to be resting in, 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 in Santa Cruz. You want to be sure that the data is reasonably uniform, right? that the labs are consistent with each other. Um, and luckily, the head of the project at the very beginning was a man named Ewan Burney, uh, an English um, biologist. And he, for example, stressed that there should be two biological replicates for each assay. And as you'll see, that enabled us, to some extent, to, to, um, to do quality control. And of course, there are many other measure, measures as well. OK, so um, I'll s skip this. This is basically, although this is the, the paper in which, in which some of our contributions, uh, well, they appear in a lot of the papers, but certainly in that one. Uh, but these are basically assays which are very widely used. Uh, ChIP-seq for finding binding size, DNAs, uh, highly sensitive sites. Uh, these are uh, places where things um, may happen, so to speak. And RNA-seq, which produces, which, which in principle is giving you the output of uh, the active uh, genome. Uh, I think I'll, I'm going to go uh, over these quickly. This is all, uh, um, what is it? Not, not so relevant to us. Just a lot of work was went into this, this, uh, this project, and not only for humans, but also as you can see for mice. And in fact, there's another project which isn't mentioned here called Mod Encode, where Mod stands for model, where you have the same sort of thing. This was done only during the second period of Encode for not only mouse but also the worm, C. elegans, and the fly. And of course, the reason you have that is you can't, you can't perform experiments on humans. You can't try to validate things on humans easily, but you may do it on, 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 on animals. Um, OK, so this is the prototype of this encyclopedia, which is only now really being uh, formulated as an encyclopedia. And uh, this gives you a, a sense of what it looks like. Uh, this is. Um, an important point is that when the whole thing started in 2003, uh, we knew of 25,000 protein coding genes. There were a few non-coding genes identified, but relatively few. There was very little regulatory information ma mapped, right? I mean, so the genes are there, and they're the, they're the ones who produce the proteins, but somebody has to tell them what to do and when to do it. <laughs> and uh, in fact, a lot at least among a subset of people, uh, you had talk of junk DNA. There, was the, there were the genes, and there was junk DNA for the rest. Uh, in 2015, as you saw, fewer protein coding genes. Many were not, not validated by the finer assays. Uh, thousands of non-coding genes, and tremendous amounts of potential regulatory DNA, binding sites and, 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 and um, things of that kind. OK, contributions of our group. And so the uh, early ENCODE, perhaps they were the most substantial, two papers, one on subsampling methods for genomic inference, the other one measuring reproducibility of high throughput experiments. I'll talk a bit about those. 
Middle ENCODE had uh, papers which were more of a biological flavor, uh, one being a comparison of the fly and the worm's early development. And surprisingly, you could establish some correspondences. And then the second is a, a, um, an assay which was, uh, or a method which was developed primarily by Nathan Boley, a, uh, a student in, in, in our group, for getting very accurate, well, resolving ambiguities in determining transcripts, in many cases, by using additional information. And current ENCODE, which is in progress, uh, identifying, we hope to identify interacting features in random forests, which is a classification algorithm, uh, applied to SNPs, genes, etc. Random forest, as many of you may know, is a wonderful classification engine, but it's not so easy to derive from it what matters, right? It's, uh, as many things in machine learning, it's a good prediction method. Uh, then relating genotype to phenotype with uh, in, in, um, uh, with uh, some, some people at UCSF, uh, um, Mr. Marson. And then deriving 3D structure from high C experiments. There, a method which has been developed in the last couple of years, I think, which tries to identify at least aspects of the three-dimensional structure of, of DNA. Right? I mean, DNA is packed in, in there, these nine billion, uh, three billion base pairs, is packed in, this, in, 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 in the cell, uh, well, times the number of chromosomes, and, and, and no, sorry, three billion is total, right? Um, and most of it is inaccessible, right? And so you see things happening, for example, which appear to be far in the linear structure. But in fact, it may be that they're actually very close in the three-dimensional structure. And uh, this is really sort of in its infancy, this, this, this method. So let me start with the first paper, which, which uh, probably I think we're, we're, uh, we're best known for in this context, which is measuring reproducibility of high-throughput experiments. OK, and this actually had to do primarily with one assay, which was ChIP-seq. And ChIP-seq was, uh, is an experiment, which, or an assay, which leads to identification of protein binding sites. Or, or that is, you have a protein produced by one gene. It arrives to bind at a position upstream of another gene. And in, it, if, if things are right, <laughs> It'll start, it'll initiate action of the, second, of, the, of the second gene. And the data looks like this, if you see on the bottom. And in fact, that's true of many assays. You basically have a trace. This is a trace running along the genome. And the peaks, roughly speaking, correspond to points where the assay thinks something is happening. And the issue is you want to identify the peaks. Now, the problem is that, in fact, the peaks dissolve into noise fairly quickly. And so this was really the first instance where, or prototype instance, if you want, where we wanted to try to make sure that things were done uniformly. Now, it turns out already, by the time these assays were carried out, there was something like 10 peak callers Right? Different, different algorithms, all of which purported to pick out the peaks with different tuning parameters. Some employed FDR, some employed p-values, some employed, employed, uh, employed uh, more, more, more modest measures of strength. But they all had, had, had uh, default values. And the question was, all right, uh, we, we have to pick one of these because that's what's available or more than one, let's see what's reliable. Of course, it would be ideal if we knew what ground truth was. But of course, we don't. That's the reason we're doing these assays. And so and it turns out, as I, as I was suggesting, that the peak calls depend on the parameter settings of the algorithms. The significant scores are not comparable across algorithms. And they're not calibrated at all to each other. Well, and the, really only the, the only reasonable, I thought, way that we could go was to use the replicates. Remember that 
we were asked to have two biological replicates for each assay. So you can't check validity that way, but you can check stability, right? So hopefully, an assay which agrees pretty much on the two biological replicates should be pretty good. OK. All right, so this is, there's an initial solution which we did not use, which is a naive, which is the na most naive solution one could think of. First of all, pretend that you have, you, you now have this, you have these two replicates. And for each of these replicates, each of these replicates, you have, we're looking at one peak caller now. And it's identified peaks on each of the replicates. And uh, xi and yi are the intensity of these peaks as reported by this, by this um, uh, caller. Well, as I said, there are the, 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 the good peaks and the bad peaks. And it seems very plausible that the good peaks are situations where the replicates peaks are both high intensity and they're correlated. On the other hand, the bad peaks are ones which have nothing to do with each other. And so you can think of a stochastic model. Now, of course, this is all a story, right? I mean, this is not a sample from any population, right? But, OK, let's pretend that it, it acts like a sample. And in a way, it doesn't really matter uh, for, for these purposes. Uh, we're not, um, and these are all sort of semi-descriptive measures. So you can say, OK, what I have is a mixture of two bivariate Gaussians. One bivariate Gaussian corresponding to the good guys, and one bivariate Gaussian corresponding to the bad guys. And one minus epsilon percent, 100 percent of the peaks are good, and the other are bad. Well, um, that's. And bad simply means that they have nothing to do with each other, right? Things are independent. Because of the fact that you would expect that the, that the two replicates behave the same, you would expect, let's say, that the means are the same, right? And for both components, and that the variances are the same for both components. Not components of the mixture, but the two, the two replicates. Now, there's unfortunately a problem, and I think I had, uh, where, where is the problem? Oh, well, OK, now let me continue. I'm going to give you the, the naive solution. So the naive solution is, given that information, if in fact it were a sample, there are simple estimates of all of the parameters. The proportion, the, 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 the means, the variances, the correlation, just um, using the EM algorithm. Right? I mean, when I said simple, it's not that you can just go in and compute them, right? Because remember, it's a mixture. It's not a single Gaussian. But there is this algorithm. There are, of course, other algorithms as well. But the algorithm, the EM algorithm, expectation maximization algorithm, is that we pretend we know which component we initiate by pretending knowing which component of the mixture, good or bad, each observation is from. Using that but not really knowing the identity, but you can, you can get an estimate. Uh, or if I tell you what the values of the parameters are, I can get an estimate of the probabilities of these things. Not of, not of really of the identity, but I can es estimate what the probability is of being good or being bad and so on. OK. And then, of course, having now I can do maximum likelihood very easily, right? Because now I have closed form estimates. In that case, I get a new estimate of the parameters, right? I go through the process again. I estimate the proportions, et cetera, et cetera, and, and cycle through. And in the end, we get something. It converges. That's, that's uh, because the likelihood actually increases. And we get something which uh, we might call, it isn't what we call, the IDR, the posterior probability that xi, yi belongs to the bad set, right? Which is simply the uh, more or less uh, epsilon times the density of the bad component divided by the marginal density of the mixture. But there is a problem. 
the data are not Gaussian. In fact, it's known these biological replicates, yeah, sure, they're, they're, they're from the same, um, they're being applied uh, roughly to the same, same cell, I mean, cell bunches, but uh, the, 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 um, there's no reason to believe that the scales of the two assays are the same. So what do you do? Well, so here's, here's our proposal, which, which worked quite well with ChIP-seq. The original model is that you have a mixture of two Gaussians, right? One being an arbitrary bivariate Gaussian and the other one being a Gaussian with independent components. Now tell yourself that there exists an unknown scale for each of the two coordinates, right? H1 and H2, and these are just unknown monotone increasing. You can pretend they're smooth functions, but they're unknown. So now you go from what's called, from the usual kind of model, a parametric model, to a semi-parametric model, because now you have parameters, the usual parameters, and then you have these infinite dimensional parameters, H1 of X and H2 of Y. Now, you can easily convince yourself that in this model, you cannot estimate all of the parameters that you had before. For example, you can't estimate the individual means, but you can estimate their difference. Why? Because shifting is a monotone transformation. You can only estimate the ratio of the scales, because, again, and you can estimate the correlation coefficient, and you can estimate epsilon as proportion. That turns out goes all. All these can be estimated in the sense that they're identifiable. OK, so the current solution is based on the ENCODE pipe, for the ENCODE pipeline. You have to have an algorithm now, a more complicated algorithm to compute these, is based on the following elementary re uh, relation. If F1 of theta is the marginal uh, uh, CDF, of H1 inverse of X, and F2 theta is the marginal CDF of H2 inverse of Y, and F1, F2 are the corresponding CDFs of Xi, Yi, right? The, the actual empirical population CDFs. Then you have this simple relation. Fj of X is Fj of Hj of X and theta. Which means that we can invert this if we know theta. And you get hj of x is fj inverse of fjx and theta. So if you know theta, you have a naive estimate. Namely, you plug in for this fjx the empirical observed distribution function of the x-coordinate, and the same thing for the y's. Actually, it turns out you can, uh, you can see that this estimate depends only on the ranks, as you what might expect. What stays fixed if you put arbitrary monotone transformations on the two coordinates? The only thing that really stays fixed are the ranks, the pairs of ranks. So you have this. And now the algorithm is essentially the same as before, except that there's another step. And the other step is that you construct pseudo-observations Right? You start out with a theta hat old. Xi theta hat old is this estimate of H1 applied to Xi, the observation, and theta hat old. And, y, and So these things, if in fact H hat were H1, theta hat old were theta, would in fact be a mixture of two Gaussians. That's exactly how this is constructed. Now you apply EM to the pseudo observations. You get a new theta. Then you redefine your pseudo-observations, and then you do it again. And you iterate to convergence, and thanks to uh, uh, the skill of people in my group and others, this algorithm works fast, fast enough to actually deal with the mountains of data that ENCODE produces. And here's the comparison, the original comparison of the um, various uh, um, peak callers. Um, 
here's the number of significant peaks called, and the IDR, remember, is still defined as uh, the posterior probability of belonging to a bad, uh, to, a, to, to, to a, a, a bad part of the population. And basically, the ones which um, stay the longest, right, they have the lowest IDR for the largest number of peaks are the good ones. So here's three which are quite close to each other. Yes? Oh, no, if, if, there's the color code. So these are names. Peak Seek, Max, SPP, F Seek, Hotspot, these are all peak callers, right? Each of these things is basically, you have a peak caller and you want to decide how is it performing in terms of its consistency on the two replicates. And the peak caller, which has the lowest IDR for the longest time, is best. Now, actually, just to, to mention one, one uh, uh, an aside, uh, we, ha we did have some other validation, which was not terribly good either, of, of this method, that there are computational ways of trying to identify these, purely computational ways of trying to identify these peaks, which are more or less accepted. And in fact, our choices did agree pretty well with it. But that's not real validation. Um, the other thing, unfortunately, is that this worked very well for ChIP-seq, but worked far worse for RNA-seq, for other assays. And basically, if you looked at it, you didn't get Gaussian pictures. Right? When you made the transformation, you expected the thing to look like two superimposed bivariate Gaussians. Right? And in fact, but in fact, work is proceeding on that now. And you have the freedom, after all. Nothing says that the thing has to be a mixture of bivariate Gaussians. Right? Uh, Remember that this is all a story, right? I mean, we don't really believe these things are bivariate Gaussian. The other, the other um, paper, which is a method which we liked and which has been used to some extent, but not so extensively. The IDR is ensconced in the, in the, in the uh, um, ENCODE pipeline, is and the, and the reason, as you'll see why, is, is it's a more delicate method, is for another purpose. So let me describe that. Here's a question that arose almost immediately also. Do two factors tend to bind together more closely or more often than other pairs of factors? Right? So you have various features, if you want, on the genome, various experimental annotations. And you notice that two experimental annotations tend to overlap each other a lot. Can you say that this is happening really, or is it by chance in some sense? Now, there's an issue. And the issue is, what do you mean by expectation? What do you mean by ra at random? <laughs> what does chance mean in this context? Because the genome is highly structured, right? and structured in ways that we don't even know, right? The relations we don't know. So analysis of feature interdependence must account for superficial structure, or at least structure which is somehow irrelevant <laughs> of the overlap of the features. So oh, expected at random is overlap between two feature sets bearing structure under no biological constraints. That's what we're trying. So we propose the model, and again, this is purely a notional model. It's no attempt to try to, 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 uh, uh, to really build in evolutionary considerations, partly because the evolutionary models of mutation, at, in independent mutation at different sites are <laughs> not, not all that plausible, and also partly because you know, all sorts of things could have, could have happened. So these are the models. These are the minimal models such that one can give some sort of meaningful answer to this question. So the model is, imagine that whatever it is that you're interested in, call it xi, and it could be 
the identity of the base at position i, or it could be something having to do with a small neighborhood of the base. Okay? But anyway, so you have all along the genome, or all along the stretch of the genome, these xi values. All right? And what you assume, and so that's going to be one feature, and there's going to be yi fe values for another feature, for example. Uh, you assume that you have segmented stationarity. That is, if you only knew you could divide the genome up into blocks, and these blocks need not actually be contiguous, such that within each block, these features, x and y, are stationary, approximately. So what does that mean? That basically means, I think it's on the next slide, <laughs> within a segment, for k small compared to the minimum segment length, the statistics of random k-mers do not differ between large subsegments of the segment, right? So the empirical distribution of single values of the x's for the first half of this long segment is about the same as the empirical distribution for the second half of this long segment. The empirical distribution of consecutive uh, bases in the first half is about the same as in the second half. The empirical distribution of the first third, et cetera. Of course, this breaks down after some, <laughs> at some point, but that's the idea. That's stationarity. And then the other one is mixing, which I, I, I sort of skipped over. The mixing assumption is that essentially knowledge of a kamer does not help in predicting a distant kamer. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're independent, but it's very, very weak dependence, which dies off as, 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 as the length goes. Well, here's some theory, uh, which I'll just tell you quickly. Segmented stationarity, exponential mixing, and fraction of short segments tending to zero implies asymptotic normality of linear statistics. What's a linear statistic? Well, it's a sum of functions of the individual xi's. Of the, you, you, you repeat the same function. Of course, again, you, you can, in fact, in principle, these conditions, I'm not being very precise about these. It's, of course, true that you can get sums of even uh, independent things, right, which are not Gaussian. They're Poisson, for example. But most things that behave themselves are Gaussian. And as you'll see, the method that, I'm propose, that we propose is such that you have sort of a visual check on those. OK. Then, if you simply think of one segment, then under suitable conditions on L, which is the length of the segment, um, different station. Oh, and if there are more than one. Oh, oh yes, yes, sorry. OK. Uh, what does this theorem say? It says that. Suppose that you think that there are these segments, and you've constructed a method which actually doesn't take the segments into account, or it takes too few segments into account. Then you can show that the results that you get are heavier tailed than they would be if you have a single homogeneous segment. Basically, if you have heterogeneity, the thing gets more dispersed. Therefore, you're getting a method which, which is conservative, even if you don't quite have the right segments. And then, if the true segmentation is correctly estimated, then, then segmented bootstrap is consistent. I haven't yet told you what segmented bootstrap is, but I will. Um, and by the delta method, you're not really, really limited to linear statistics. You're OK for smooth functions of linear things, which most interesting things are, the ratios of, of for example, one of the things we looked at was overlap, right? Just to simply count the number of base pairs in the overlap of two things. Well, that's the ratio of two linear statistics. OK, so here is, and this actually in some incarnations has an animation, but I think in this one doesn't. <laughs> uh, so this is the block bootstrap. So, so the idea, well, OK, so there are two options. One option is to do, work out some theory and work out some formulae 
for the variances of these Gaussians. Unfortunately, they depend on infinite series. You don't know where to cut the infinite series. That also doesn't tell you too much. The other way is to use a bootstrap. So what is a bootstrap? Or what is the block bootstrap? You use a method of data-dependent simulation. So, um, well, let's just look at one of them, one segment. And I'm pointing there, but people can't see me. Let's look at just, ugh, I'm not using the pointer. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, just look at that one. Well, and let's say that this is, has, is half of the length of the whole thing. Now what you do is you draw subsamples of length L. And I think this L should not be the, the same. Well, this L has nothing to do with the length of the segment, so this is not quite right. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Okay. Um, L is the total number of observations you're going to end up using for this one simulation trial, and you are using that fraction of them. So ignore that. Ignore the F2, the F3. Just imagine that you just have one segment. So you draw a subsample of length L, which means not that you pick at random. You pick a block of length L. Now on that block, you can compute the statistic that you were going to compute on the whole thing, right? Overlap for that block. That block is fairly long, so this is meaningful. You do that many, many, many times. Now you have an empirical distribution, okay? That empirical distribution actually, if in fact the Gaussianity assumptions are right, approximately, is in fact has, as you might expect, uh, too big a variance because it's based on fewer than the number of observations in the whole segment. But you can rescale it. You simply rescale it by square root of L over N. And that actually works for one segment and it works for a bunch of segments. You basically get this empirical distribution should be approximating the truth, which you want. And uh, here's an example. This, this is, of course, only a simulation, unfortunately. But it's an example of what happens. So here's the true distribution, which we've constructed. Here's something that people do use instead of the, I mean, you know, without knowing about the block bootstrap, you just randomly shuffle sites. You move, you move the initial point of the feature that you're interested in randomly. You know, and then look again. Uh, that gives you this answer, whose shape is right, but it's too narrow. The block bootstrap without segmentation, you should be segmenting. It doesn't look right, but it's very broad. It's conservative, which is what I claim. And then here's the block bootstrap with the true segmentation. Looks pretty well, much like that. And here it is with, a, with an estimated segmentation. This is all under the happiest of situations. Uh, I said that this is a rather delicate story. And, and uh, it's delicate because if you notice your parameters, right? There's the parameter, which is the length of this segment. There's the determination, not of the segment, of the, of the amount that the block that you pick. There's the length of the segments. And in fact, one has to be careful. One thing, though, that, that, that gives one some comfort is that when you look at the empirical distribution of these things, for the particular length you've chosen, it should look itself Gaussian. It may not have the right variance, but it should look Gaussian. So you have some sort of visual test that what you're doing is not unreasonable. Uh, oops, wrong thing. I think I will perhaps skip that and maybe give, yeah, I, I will. So this, um, uh, just to tell you what the, what the, what the, um, uh, 
what the part I've skipped is, it's if you want to test the hypothesis of there being no association, right? You need the null distribution under that hypothesis. But of course, your data doesn't obey that null distribution, right? So you have to construct the null distribution. And you play a game which I will uh, tell anybody who wants to hear about it later. OK, so now we come to, to, to much easier stuff. No equations, no math. Uh, just some stories from mid-end code. And this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's statistics of a rather naive sort. So, so the, 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 the issue is the following. As part of mod end code, one had time studies of the development of Drosophila and uh, C. elegans, the worm. And you, you sequence these things. You have, you have, you have expressions of, of, of genome, you have genome, gene expression data for these things. Now, uh, you would like, I mean, these things are separated by an enormous evolutionary distance, the fly and, 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 and the worm. Nevertheless, there are lots and lots of orthologous genes. So what's an orthologous gene? Genes which uh, whose base pair composition in the two animals is about the same. So maybe you can establish some correspondence between genes which are active in the appropriate periods for fly and for um, um, worm. Well, here are the two life cycles, and you can see that they're really quite different. Here is the, is the, is the uh, development of the fly, uh, which starts out with a, as a larva, moves into a uh, pre-pupil stage, uh, embryo, and so on, until it's, it's essentially grown here. Um, it's got a lot of stages, right? Here is the worm. The worm not only has fewer stages, but it's quite bizarre. I mean, for example, it has a whole little different life cycle it can take here in which it's a hermaphrodite. <laughs> um, but there are at least things which, which, which you might hope match. Well, initially, it was extremely, so, so what you do is you simply look at orthologous genes and you see how many of them are active. Initially, just see how many of them are active at the same time, in the same stage. That didn't give us anything. So we had a lot of comparison methods which didn't give us anything. Finally, we hit on something very simple. So what this tells you is um, the, well, let's look at this. This is, uh, this is the fly. And this is C. elegans. And this is a match of blocks of, of, of genes. And it actually splits into, into a couple of parts. Now, how were these genes determined? They were genes which would appear at very high intensity in the fly in one stage, but uh, in not more than one other stage of the fly. <laughs> And the same thing with the worm. So in other words, you focused on, on things which were very specific to given times. And you got some amusing correspondences. I won't obviously tell you about most of those because I don't know them. But the correspondence which we found at first seemed very surprising was between the adult fly and the worm egg. And that turns out to make perfect sense because the adult fly is full of eggs. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's an amusing exercise which came out of mod encode data. Uh, this I'll go over quite quickly. This is a paper in Nature Biotechnology. Uh, it's a technique developed by Nathan Boley, who's a 
because I, I think I mentioned this earlier, who was a um, member of our group. And essentially, uh, the problem that he, that, that he was dealing with is a problem which, which is you wanted to, a given gene can produce many transcripts. Some genes produce only one or two. I believe there was one which, which, which uh, had almost uh, in the thousands, in fact. This is rare. But it, so what does that mean? Well, I don't know if you know how, 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 how um, the RNA, which then gets turned into DNA, is produced. What happens is there's an enzyme, uh, polymerase, which reads along. And then there are these segments called exons and introns. OK? So ideally, in fact, what we've learned initially is that you cut out the, the introns. And it's only the exons that get translated. Well, it's true that you cut out the, in, the, cut out the introns, but you may also cut out some exons. So in fact, there are many combinatorially, many, many possibilities of that. And it turns out that what kind of data do you have? You have reads. Right, you have segments of the gene which, uh, which come, you know, you have, well, you have pieces of RNA, right, short pieces of RNA, which you can stick back onto the genome, so to speak. And if there's, a, if there's RNA there, then something is happening. Well, unfortunately, uh, these pieces are fairly short. Some of these genes are quite long. And so you can't tell the difference in many cases. It's, things are ambiguous. Right? If you see um, RNA here and RNA here, but nothing in between, that could be because both of those were translated or because they were put together. Right? They could have be, been translated independently. They could have been put together. So there are all sorts of ambiguities like that. And what Nathan figured out was using other information to narrow down the ambiguity. You can't move it around. But in fact, it's much better than this very popular method called cufflinks, which uh, basically takes a mathematician's point of view. When there's ambiguity, you choose the most elegant and shortest path. Well, unfortunately, nature doesn't correspond, doesn't conform to that. Uh, this is confidence intervals, which uh, this is, a, unfortunately, this is, this is a uh, synthetic gene, but where everybody seems to have gotten the wrong answer. Because <laughs> in fact, nothing is happening. The green is the, is, is the, is the, uh, um, the truth. Right? Green is the truth. However, both, all the other methods have indicate that at least two of them are real. Because their confidence bounds are uh, are out of, you know, they don't have confidence bounds uh, where, in fact, nothing is happening. OK, that's, uh, let's see. Well, I have a few minutes left. Um, uh, OK, let me just mention this quickly uh, here. So I th some of you may know a, a, a kind of classifier called random forests. Random forests, like, New, uh, neural nets, like, 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 like deep learning and so on. These are all classifiers which have very nice prediction properties, but you can't really tell very easily what the hell is doing the prediction, right? And the idea here is to try, and I won't give uh, an elaborate description because they're still, they're, they're working on it, but basically it's to look Random forest produces trees, many trees. And you sort of look in the trees and see where the decisive splits are occurring. And from that, you get a bunch of features. And then there's a method of sifting through these features. And then you end up with things which, uh, in some examples, have turned out uh, well validated. OK, I'm actually. Directions in year three and four, we're going to refine the soft, well, forget about that. That's, that's, that's for the purposes of the ENCODE program officers, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, 
the benefits of ENCODE, we've started a project which is, ENCODE is composed of many sub-projects. Uh, this is the part that I'm most interested in, uh, uh, the CHARGE consortium, which for some reason has not appeared here yet. Oh, it's here. <laughs> the CHARGE consortium is a different group whose, whose interest is in heart disease and aging. They have many thousands, cohorts of thousands of patients in Holland, from the Erasmus University in, 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 in Rotterdam. And what we're interested in is relating, in brief, phenotype and genotype. And so that's charge, that's work in progress. And this is actually uh, also work which we're actually uh, initiating with a uh, MD, PhD at UCSF. Again, on trying to relate the genotype to phenotype, in this case, in inflammatory diseases. So, that's it. Thank you.